We are a monthly Zoom seminar that features creators and makers of Judaic art. In every episode, we feature a different artist focusing on their work. My partners in crime, Karen Glickman, Michelle Doktorov, and I, at the beginning of the pandemic, were looking for something to entertain ourselves, something that we could do online, and we discovered that we love Judaica. And we thought, if we love talking to these artists, maybe others would like to talk to them or listen to them too. And it turns out it's a true story. People were interested and we're so proud of the community that we have created and the fans of this kind of work who come back again and again. When I look at the people who register, I'm so excited not only for the old friends or the friends that have been with us for a long time, but the artists who come back as well and you know who you are, and also for, of course, all our new friends who have joined us. We're very proud of this kind of audience, people who love this kind of work. We are proud to acknowledge our artistic alliance with the American Guild of Judaic Art. Founded in 1991 in New York City, the American Guild of Judaic Art's continuing mission has been to support Jewish artists by promoting awareness of fine art and ritual objects created in the Jewish spirit. Their mission is to celebrate the rich diversity and beauty of Judaic art around the world and to establish a community for those who are inspired to fulfill the mitzvah of Hidur mitzvah by creating, collecting, and exhibiting Jewish art and objects. We at Art and Scroll Studio define Judaica as any work that takes as its inspiration Jewish heritage, Jewish life cycle events, Israel, aspects of the Bible, but we don't only do that. We like to dig deep into the artist's approach and we like to show a wide variety of the artist's work nestled within it, the Judaica aspect. We at Art and Scroll Studio must make mention of the horrifying events going on in the world. And we know that art can seem like a luxury to those whose world is disappearing. We know that art can shine a light on history, and we hope for a time soon when this can happen. I want to invite you to post in the chat how you heard about us and where you're from, and most importantly, questions that you would have for Josh because he will take those questions at the end. So post your questions in the chat as they occur to you. Don't wait until the end because then it's too late. So <laughs> post them when you think of them. Art and Scroll Studio is happy to share with you the closed caption option. So simply click on the CC at the bottom of the screen for your viewing accessibility. And now to our guest of honor, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Josh. Joshua Weiner is an artist and architect committed to the design, fabrication and installation of traditional and contemporary mosaics and murals for interior and exterior architectural settings. Joshua started his professional career creating architectural art in 1991, following graduation from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. He also trained as a painter, graduating with a degree in fine arts from Yale University in 1978. Joshua's Jewish heritage it chases, traces back to his Lithuanian Jewish ancestors. His work is recognized nationally and internationally. He lives in Boston. And before I go on to say a bit of my thoughts about Josh's work, I know Josh wanted to say a word or two about people who have joined us here tonight. Well, th thanks, Shelley, for um, first of all, for doing this and for, for all, all of your team who are behind it. And I know we'll have thank yous at the end, so we'll get back to that. But for now, I just wanted to say hi to my friends and family and my colleagues, uh, fellow mosaic artists and art lovers. I'm so glad you wanted to come tonight. Um, Shelley's gonna be asking me some interesting questions. I think uh, these are questions I probably have not been asked before. So you'll hear me speaking on the spot a lot. So bear with me if I take a moment or two to, to figure out what I wanna say, but really thank you for coming. I'm so, I, I, I've seen your names as you entered into the waiting room. So it's really, really fun for me and, and thanks to all. And we'll get a chance for more thank yous later, but first I wanna just say a word about my opinion of Joshua's work because I've been working together with him for a while as we put this together. When I think of his work, 
I think of the interplay of hard surface materials in texture and tone, a variety of shiny surface, dull surface, textured surfaces, alongside community integration that is bound into the design and the fabrication. So when I think of his work, I think of beautiful, joyous, some sort of union of both a spiritual element as well as all the amazing textures that come into play. So with that, Josh, I'm going to ask you your first question. Did you want to be an artist when you were young? <laughs> you know, um, I always, like a lot of artists would, would probably answer that question. I, I always thought of myself as an artist. It wasn't a matter of what I wanted. It was something that I, I did. My mother and my grandmother were, were both visual artists and I grew up making art always. And um, so it was just a natural evolution for me. My dad was a doctor. So it, for many years, I thought professionally I would be a doctor making art. But the idea that uh, I would ever think about making art was never really there. I always just, that's what I did. And that's still what I do. It's my, it's my way of inter interacting with the world out there. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because one question I have for you is, you've done many community engagement pieces and the people will come to see that as we go through your slides. But I wanna ask you, what do you think people learn about themselves when they participate in your fabrication process? What, what do they get out of it? You know, one of the things that almost everybody says when, when they're invited to work on a community art project is they say, you know, I don't really know if I should, I'm not an artist, I have no artistic talent, uh, that, that kind of thinking. And I say, well, you know, just try and, and we'll have a good time. And even if you just feel like working for a little while. And most people find very quickly that the work that the kind of work that we do as a team isn't hard to do. And it gives them a tremendous sense of, um, of connecting to the, to the community that we're part of through making something with their hands that's gonna be part of that community's life. So, so it's been a really positive experience. And for me, it's the, probably the, the, the biggest pleasure I get is when I'm working with other people on the projects. That's, that's the time that I'm most joyful because it's so much in the moment. So that's part of that leads right into my second question or my third question rather, which is what pieces do you enjoy most? Those that has a community, have a community involvement or those where you get to work with a committee, make a design and you're free to execute it yourself? You know, I, I really do get, as I was saying a moment ago, the greatest pleasure for me is, is that time that I'm working with the community. Uh, you know, other aspects of it are interesting. And sometimes I'll get into a groove in my own studio when I'm working on, on parts of the project. But the reality is that the, the greatest joy is, is when it's a shared experience, whether it's a one or two people or whether it's a crowd of 20 or 30 people. That's when uh, I don't even think about the fact that we're making art. It's just very much in the moment, just uh, just uh, interacting as a group, doing something. It's a bit like being part of a team. I often compare it to what it must be like for someone singing in a chorus or someone performing in the theater. And when you're designing these pieces, you must have in your mind, these elements will be introduced by the community and you must sort of design, I'm asking, with that in mind. Yes, that's right. I mean, and that's usually developed as we're developing the, the concept for the project. We're thinking about what part can the community be involved with. And sometimes we have very specific things like making handmade clay tiles or bringing in your old broken pottery and integrating that, bringing things from Israel. There's a lot of different ways that we've gone about it over the years. Okay, let's go on a journey now. Let's go and see, take, go through the years and see where you started and how it all began. Can you see the screen share? Josh, yeah, can I, you? Yes, I can, sure. Okay, great. Okay, we're gonna start off here. And this is a long time ago, and this is not a mosaic. In fact, this is a mural. Tell us a bit about how this mural came to be and what it is. I did this in 1991. It was a competition in, in the city of Boston for a piece of public art in the trompe l'oeil style. And trompe l'oeil is French for fool the eye. And in that period, the whole idea of taking blank urban walls and turning them into building facades was actually very common. Um, 
it's a it's a thing that's passed now but for about 10 years it was a it was very much kind of the rage in mural painting and it was perfect for me because of my love both of architecture and painting and it's on Newbury Street in Boston which is in the heart of Back Bay which is our cultural district so the theme for it was a celebration of the arts and history of Boston. So you won a competition with this one. Did you, uh, was part of your presentation who these people were? Because I know there is a, um, some kind of a, a map here that shows who the people were. Uh -huh, yeah. Um, you know, the planning had to do with including lots and lots of people, but we hadn't worked out who the people would be. Um, my part of the competition was to create the drawing that, um, the drawing that shows the the design of the wall with the whole idea and this is typical of my work to have a structure that can have other things layered onto the structure that's the way i work as a designer to create a composition that can then be fleshed out with all kinds of details i find this so fascinating this is a detail of one of the windows there tell us about who we're looking at here well that's a fun one for me personally because it's a table of the artists and architects that are part of boston's history I won't name all of them, but there's a few of them people might recognize. Um, uh, N.C. Wyeth, who's the, the patriarch of the Wyeth family is in yellow on the left. And next to him is, is uh, Henry Hobson Richardson. These are all Boston residents. Jo John Singer Sargent, who had a big connection to Isabella Stewart Gardner, who was his patron and was a prominent uh, impresario here in, in the city of Boston. Winslow Homer with the straw hat was from Needham, Massachusetts. Frederick Law Olmsted, the landscape architect of, of Central Park is in the, the trench coat. He was uh, from Brookline, Mass and so on. It's an amazing um, tableau of uh, people from different eras. And I think people must have enjoyed it tremendously. And it shows and speaks to your skill as an, you're an amazing painter. And tell us a bit about this chateau that we're looking at here. Uh -huh. Well, the chateau is called uh, Chateau Picontal, and it's in the High Alps region of France, about two and a half hours north of Marseille. Uh, some friends of mine bought this building about 20 years ago with the idea of turning it into a hotel. And I persuaded them that I was the right person to decorate the whole interior because my son, who's that little blip in the photo that you pointed to, is that the little blip marching up the field is my son Charles when he was three years old when they bought the building. And I wanted the pro to do the project so that I could spend a lot of time with him. And he, set, he and his mom settled right, right in that region of France. Well, one of the reasons I love these two particular images is because you've been able to capture so well. You're such a, an amazing, um, with the amazing quali qualified detail painter. A lot of people don't realize that what makes things look real for example, our shadows. And if you look here in the details, you'll see all the shadows that make those flowers look like they're coming down at you. And of course the sky and you, your skills are boundless as regards to murals. But let's take a look at your first mosaic piece that we're gonna study. It's a triptych, which means it has three panels. What, what is this piece that we're looking at? This is for a temple in Wellesley, Mass, which is a suburb of Boston. Um, it's a uh... It's a tribute to the name of the temple, Temple Beth Elohim. So it, it, it's, ab it's abstract, but you can, I think you can see the image of a shofar, a Torah scroll unrolling, Jacob's ladder, uh, a tree of life, and a lot of other things. That's, that's one of the things I like about these ab abstract works of art is that they can be read in lots and lots of ways. Um, the grid in the background was my idea of an ordered universe and the blue, um, brush strokes are the Jewish diaspora that's originating in, in the, a pocket of the universe and crossing the Torah and, and crossing in and out of Jewish education. So it's, it's really quite stunning the, the degree to which you have thought these things out. Nothing in your work is random. Everything has a, an order to it and yet it's so exuberant and sort of jumping with joy. And here I have a detail the this um what did you call this this the the grid in the background well i call that the ordered universe <laughs> it's what keeps us from chaos so and all of that was made from stone which is kind of interesting in itself it's basically made from a stone that we thought of as jerusalem stone 
it's beautiful. I particularly want to call people's attention to how each one of these squares has tiles going in different directions. We have a brickwork here, we have a patchwork here, almost like a basket hatch. And all of these things read from a distance like a, an overall texture. But when you look up close, you can see all those different patterns. Tell me when you designed this, did you plan out every one of those squares? Well, in more of a general way, Shelley, one of the great things about being a muralist, working large, is the idea that you create a piece of art that people can see from a distance as a single image. Then when they come close, just like you're describing now, they see all these other things. They see texture, they see uh, material changes, they see uh, details, and they can start to read it as if you're inside of a world and you're reading different parts of the world. So a lot of those things are planned in advance, but a lot of them happen while we're starting to develop them. I usually make a, a, a sample board of all the materials so I can study how they all come together because the technical side of this is also pretty complicated. So I want to point out here that these are these the pieces you mentioned that individuals have contributed? Yep, and we'll look at a slide in a minute that shows how people make them. They were made at a, a children's workshop in pay, during Pesach, and they were all made by kids. Um, the, now, what are these? This isn't clay. What is this material? So that's stained glass, and I had to create a ceramic backer for each of those in my kiln because the glass is thinner than all the other tiles. The, those stone tiles and ceramic tiles are quite thick, and I wanted everything to be at the same surface. So that's why they're all numbered, so I could keep track of the front and the back of all of them. And what is this little special spot here? So there are three triangular pieces of mirror in the part of the, the thing that I see as the Torah scroll, and they're um, a memory of Holocaust survivors. That's beautiful. People can see their own reflection in them. Yeah. So what are we looking at here? This looks like a workshop. So this is the children's workshop on, on Pesach. We had it at, in the courtyard outside the temple and it was great. We had about, I think we had about 200 kids and their parents and they each made a small clay tile that I glazed. And, and then we uh, brought those to the temple again and set them up in a, in a workroom and created this as a team of about, we were a team of about 200 people for that for about a month. Wow. So what are we looking at here? This is incredibly joyous. Oh yeah, this is one of my favorites. It was, it was installed the day before the, the uh, March uh, 13th uh, shutdown, March 13th, 2020. Um, it's for a temple in Newton, Mass, which is also a suburb of Boston. And it's a Lador Vador uh, from generation to generation theme, but again, in a very abstract way. Um, I don't think I'll go into all the narrative of it because it's pretty complicated, but the vision of it, I, I woke up with the vision of this one after a night's sleep where I was very, very worried about how I was going to take um, my design team's uh, hopes for this and pull them all together into one image. And this image was in my mind's eye when I woke up and I was able to draw it quite completely in about 10 minutes, which was thrilling because design isn't always like that. I'm showing a detail here because I think it's so breathtaking. And people, when you look at the overall, you, you take it in as a whole. But what are we looking at here? This looks like broken pieces of- Yeah, pieces. I asked people to bring in their broken china there. That is it's just brilliant. And the way you, the, the whole thing sings, it seems to flow. And yet it's um, got so much detail, so much to study. Are these pieces that others made? Yeah, around the circles, the lower half circle is, is um, our, our senior members, the, the generation of seniors, the upper circle is our children members. So we had seniors and children each responsible for the tiles in those sections. Beautiful. So this is a, an interesting <laughs> installation. You know, Josh and I argued about this because I didn't want to show the, in the situation. And he said, yes, you have to see how you walk through the middle of it. And in fact, he's right. It does create a beautiful, look at how there's continuity between these two pieces. They flow from one to the other. What is this installation? Well, this one's really special to me because it is a. it was created um, uh, by invitation of um, 
the cantor Hollis Schachner um, from Temple Sher Tikva in Wayland, Massachusetts. Uh, we were celebrating Hollis's 18th year as, as cantor at the temple. And she'd always wanted to do a community mosaic and she always wanted me to work with this, the, the temple. The left side, uh, the name of the temple is, is Sher Tikva, Song of Hope. So the left-hand panel is the Which first- I have here, here this one. That's the first night of Shabbat and that's the, the theme of the song. So we have, we have Exodus turning into song, into a night sky and a Torah. We have the parting of the waters in the middle. That's why showing it, showing moving through the center is important. We have the seven species and a songbird and Miriam with her tambourine. So we, we have a lot of music references in this side. And the right side is hope. So we have uh, the, the dove of hope. We have Jerusalem. We have, we have the olive tree, which was never supposed to have been able to grow in the desert. Um, and the near Tamid as a symbol of light and hope. And one, one of the things I love about this one particularly, uh, about these, the, these two, is to note this is all done in one color. This is all monochromatic in here, but so many textures, so much energy going into these little sections that it really makes the whole thing come alive. You have areas that are more ordered and then areas that have more of a free form to them. What's your thought about that? Well, there's two more things I'd like to say about this particular image. One is in response to what you said that we integrated about 30 handmade tiles. They're hidden in there, but they're there. They were made in a workshop. So the same on the left side. So that was a this that was the location in this one where we really had the congregation express themselves. And then they came into the studio and worked on it for a few weeks. Um, I also wanted to mention the woman who's standing next to me, um, I'm on the, the far right, is my friend Laurie Callis. And Laurie's my studio assistant and a very close friend, and also really my guide in, in learning about Judaism, because she has taken on her uh, religious practices in a, a much more uh, committed or serious way than I am. I'm, I'm catching up. I'm always playing catch up and learning about, about Jewish culture and, his, and, 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 um, and religious practice. But Laurie's immersed in it. So she's a wonderful partner for these projects and she works with me on other projects as well. And it's great to have this, this photo because it gives a real sense of scale as how big these pieces really are. And speaking of big, tell us about this. This is a, a very lar large piece. Um, where was this installed? This, this is for the Sukkot Shalom, the shelter of peace at the Rashi school, which is a private Jewish day school in, in Dedham, Mass. Um, uh, this room was actually created in honor of Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, and um, and the, the top is a, is a large talit that creates a shelter. Uh, within the rainbow is uh, uh, an image that represents activities at school. To the left is outreach to the local area, to Boston, and to the right is connections to Israel. It's, uh, it's very intense, very uh, detailed, and very impactful. And what are the people, what are, what have we got? Well, they're on? working on with, they're, they're working with broken tile and handmade clay letters and, and a water-based acrylic cement. So it's safe to work with your hands. And it's, what I like about this, um, the Rashi School is part of an intergenerational community in Boston that with, uh, with the Newbridge uh, um, community, which is for, mostly for seniors. And so the seniors came in and worked with the kids and their parents and the teachers. So it's great to have all these different generations working together on one project. It's beautiful. Thank you. So now this is a piece that is up high on a wall. So I don't have a good shot of it from the, from the ground, but uh, you can see this is another school, correct? Yeah, this is a, an elementary school in, um, in the North Shore of Boston in Marblehead. And they wanted to do a blessing ceremony. It's also a, a generation theme from Lador Vador. And what was fun for me on this one, aside from the blessing ceremony, was the border, which goes through the Jewish calendar, where the colors mirror seasonal changes um, in the spectrum. And again, we had everybody working on this one. But it was just fun to have the border, that particular border, um, show all these different aspects of um, of Jewish sim sim symbology. What I love about it is you've got these very, very traditional images 
And then there's like a Mac computer in the middle. Yeah. So that it's really showing the past moving into the future. And now here, what's interesting here is to show the image. Now, is this an image that you printed out for people to follow? Right. I, we always have um, aspects of the design spread out around the room so people can find the colors. Um, I, I wanted to note on this on the slide on the left, although they're not facing forward, are two very close friends, my friend Yeti Frankel in green and my friend Leanne Nodden, who's been my assistant. Both, both of these women, uh, we've worked together for years on these projects, and they both came to help out on this one. And we worked with another couple hundred kids on this one. And on the right is, is the family, the, the woman who, who sponsored it, our sponsor for the project, um, who was Beautiful. a super, super nice person. Very nice. It sounds like to be a friend of yours is to be a person who works with you. <laughs> yeah, yep. And family helps helped as well. <laughs> now, this is one of my favorite pieces. And I'm, I'm we're going to show the backstory, but uh, what, where is this located? Um, this is called Aspire, and it's in a, a cultural center in um, Western Massachusetts in a school. The school was just under construction when they brought me in, and it's uh, along a stair hall. So it goes, th uh, it brings the, the viewer on a journey from darkness at the bottom into light at the canopy at the top of the forest um, as you move along a stair. So it's along a two level stair. Just exuberant. Now this is a, an image on the right here. This is a, a maquette, correct? Of, of the design. Is that something you did yeah. in advance? Yep, yep. And I tried four different designs and this is the one we settled on. So uh, my design process sometimes is pretty a pretty long process. Do you, do you, how much say do you, when you work with uh, pe a c people and it's a commission, and you show them a design, do you allow them to modify it? Or do you say, okay, if you don't like this one, we'll do that one. Or do you work with what their suggestions are and modify it? Uh, typically at the beginning, I, I spend a lot of time listening to people talk about their vision and who, and try to learn what their tastes are in terms of style and color. And so I have a really good background before I draw anything. Um, and then I design something Sometimes I'll, like this one, I designed four different images, but I only showed the client this image because I like this one the best. Yeah, um, that's, that's a good way to go sometimes. Yeah, and I, it didn't change at all. This was exactly as I drew it, but many times they, they get adjusted. And here's some uh, images of the piece with a scaffolding here. Yeah. For, um... And this that was, was... Also, oh, I'm that sorry. Was also made, that was also made by high school kids. It took a year. <laughs> so really? They worked with their art teacher, yeah. Now we're gonna go somewhere else. Tell us about how you ended up in Thailand doing work at a hospital. I have a close friend named Mark Benelli, who's a psychiatrist and works for the United States State Department. And when he uh, took, started his tour of duty in Thailand as a regional psychiatrist, he invited me to come over and I said, I'd love to see you, but I'd like to do a few projects while I'm there. Could you find some locations for me? And um, that, and so it was all done as a volunteer from from my end. It was my 60th birthday present to myself. That's a nice gift, and the, it looks like the people there enjoy it. And they, I'm I'm not sure in in this case whether you had a team with you or did you have volunteers from the. It was all volunteers, but I I made a lot of friends there through my friends. Uh, I had a whole network of friends and I was also staying at a, I was an artist in residence in an international uh, art center. So a lot of people from that uh, place came, but mostly it was the patients and the nurses that made this with me and uh, included a lot of kids too. And speaking of kids, so you have a group here and this is another installation. What, tell us about this one. This is a, uh, this was a white, uh, unpainted Buddhist temple. The only thing in there was the Buddha and his disciple, two disciples in gold and high school kids. So I, it was orphanage high school that was uh, sponsored by uh, the princess of Thailand. And I had uh, about a hundred of these wonderful high school kids making this with me for about a month. Um, very special, happy experience. And this showing, you have multi-generations looks like. Yeah, yeah. Yep, this guy runs all of the Hollywood um, 
film projects finding locations in Thailand. He's a very cool guy. His name's Chai. Very cool piece. So now for something that really shows how architecture can be something that you weave your way in and out of. You don't necessarily always have to look at it in order to appreciate it on the wall. Tell us about this installation. This was another competition, a national design competition that I won. It was for a swimming pool. It was for four columns in the front holding up the sign ban and two in the back in Dallas in a very hot, hot part of the United States. And um, the concept that I had for the competition was to build on Matisse's cutouts called the swimming pool and to do my own version of that um, on these columns. And um, so it was fun. It was a riff on art history. Um, and yet I was able to modern, bring it up, into, up to date with, you know, a pregnant woman and, and babies and all kinds of different swimmers. And it was really a lot of fun to treat the swimmers as silhouettes. It looks, it's very joyous. And um, it really captures that sense of buoyancy. And um, here you can see it. And especially with the luminous or luminescence of the, of the materials. Can you speak a bit about that? Like well, I wanted, to use, I wanted it to be, the budget for this, like a lot of my projects, isn't really uh, high enough to pay for certain types of detail. So I had to simplify the materials in order to, to bring it in on budget so I could have a reasonable income. So I chose three types of tile. One, the uh, it, it, French, a French uh, glass from Paris, uh, porcelain, I mean, that's the, the brownish tile. But then uh, Italian glass called citrus glass, which is the small green tile, and then a mix of whites for the, the center band and using different grids for each of them. So the idea was that each grid would create its own uh, movement um, in, in um, mosaic, work, it's called andamento, which means the, the lively line, the lively movement of the line. So that's what I was playing with to make, to bring something otherwise very simple to life. It certainly captures it. I'm sure that uh, people are inspired. I mean, it, it, it creates also a sense of fun and, uh, and play. Thank you. So tell us about this. This is a big, long wall. What is, what so is this? This was, this was another competition winner. This one was with a very close friend and colleague of mine named David Fichter, who's a wonderful Boston artist who I, I've done lots and lots of projects all over the country with. Um, we, um, we created this for a nursing center that's part of Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. And the reason the imagery uh, has a, a Latin quality is it's in a Hispanic community. So we wanted to do something that related to, um, to aspects of Hispanic culture. And I, I just want to remind people to post questions in the chat. I actually don't haven't spoken to Michelle, but I'm hoping that people are asking questions. Just a reminder. So this was a competition winner. And uh, you, you must be used to getting those phone calls, Josh. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you have to go after them. I mean, um, it's a tremendous amount of work to enter a competition and, and finally be selected to do it. Um, but yeah, I've done my share and um, I, I like it better when people find me and just commission me to do the work. <laughs> but the larger projects are the competition, so they're, they're worth doing too. Tell me when you do submit something like this, is it just this elevation that they would see or do you actually also submit materials? Sometimes we'll put, give them a palette of materials, but it's almost always the elevation. Um, and often they're, they're very, very detailed. So, you know, uh, it's a real, really un uncertain as to what's gonna happen once you send in a, a design drawing. So now let's take a look at the real thing. It's filled with life and, and swirling and it's beautiful and powerful. But so what was meant to go in these archways that I'm looking at here? Those are transom windows. The building was under construction like a lot of my projects were commissioned while the building is being built. And we don't have the benefit of, of even having real, a real building to work with, we're working with drawings. Um, but as soon as we finish, they finish the building and put in the glass for that part. So can you tell us a bit about the images that we're looking at? Sure, um, these, the left image is a, is, a, is a dancer just simply because it is a joyous, beautiful image. 
she's surrounded by different aspects of health. Uh, there's a guy bowling for sports and um, uh, 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 three generations in the upper left corner. It's a little hard to make up, but there's a grandmother, a mom and a daughter. Um, in the center image, it's, it's the hands of the community lifting a baby up uh, is a symbol of, you know, community supporting the next generation. And the one on the right, it's hard to see, it's about education. Tell me, when, when you are invited to these competitions, do they say to you, and we'd like our community to have a hands-on in the project, or is that something you suggest? Um, it's part of the dialogue as we develop the project. Um, we often suggest it. It helps us actually in getting the comp in, in succeeding in being awarded the competition. Uh, so it's strategic as well as as fun. But we yes. usually we usually suggest it because you have to have a plan as to how you're going to do that too. It's it, it's not random, it's very organized. So what is what are we looking at here? So that's our friend Herminia who, who made the best tacos in the world and really bailed us out on some cold days when we were installing. She made a small um, mosaic that's taped together. You can see them, they're used at the border on the left and they're all in a, a Texas quilt pattern. And we use that as a base border. So we had nurses and, and um, community members um, probably about, I think we have about 40 of those at the bottom. And we did those in two days. That's amazing that people were able to create these. They could create whatever they wanted in their square, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. That's beautiful. And now we come to something that I find so mesmerizing in the work that you did. Tell us a bit about what this installation was and what are we looking at here? Um, well, this is one of my favorites too. The reason is it, it comes really from purely from my imagination and my own uh, my own heart. Um, it's a it's a four seasons uh, mosaic that goes around a stair hall. It was created for a new school building um, at the Meadowbrook School, which again is just slightly west of Boston in, in Western Massachusetts. Um, and it's it it also shows four habitats from the school. The school has a beautiful natural setting. So you start at the left side. This is the maquette, the drawing for it. Um, the left side shows winter turning into spring and then summer and fall and starting back to winter. The right side just shows it moving around a corner. It's a second, it's like a detail of the drawing. And now we come to this. Is, so this is the stairwell right here that I'm looking at. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a slightly, it's a, like a bird's eye shot. So it's slightly de deformed. That shows, I think, four walls that are perfect perpendicular to each other at right angles. So, but it, it, the, the, the photo flattens things out, but that's the finished artwork. And it's about, about 20 feet high and 40 feet wide. It's really a lot for a mosaic. Is that something that you uh, had participation of the community or did, is this something you produced in your studio? This one I produced in my studio with one other person who was a huge contributor, my friend Leanne Nodden. And Leanne is an artist and um, often works with either David Fichter or, or me on our larger projects. And she's just a great artist. So she brought all of her talent to this working side by side with me. It took us about four months, I think, to do this. So I have some details from it here because I'm just mesmerized how you managed to put this puzzle together. I mean, if someone showed me this in a box and said it was a thousand pieces, I would uh, return it to Amazon. Thank you very much. How do you uh, not become overwhelmed by the number of small little pieces that are gonna go into this? Well, I don't know how Leanne feels. That's Leanne on the left, but it's probably not so different than me. You have an outline and you have a maquette that shows the basic colors, but you don't have the real thing. So the whole thrill of it, it's a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle where as you find a piece that fits, you, you're closer to seeing a finished image. So that for me is what keeps me going every day is the idea that you're creating something, that something is being called out of, you know, the nothingness of, of the world into, into being, into existence. And that, that really is, always thrilling for me just to see yeah. that happen. Well, it's a little bit like improv. I mean, you're doing, you're improvising here a little bit because you know, I'm asking, you know generally what's what you're gonna do, but do you ever really know exactly what you're gonna do? 
No, and that's why it's kind of exhausting every day because you have to constantly solve problems. It's creative, it's an imagine, imaginative, but there's a lot of times where you get a little bit stuck, which is one of the reasons why having two people work together really, or more, or more, even a big group, 30, 20 or 30 people, makes the work go so much better. That's why I don't really like working alone. I get stuck. You get lonely. <laughs> lonely and stuck. And my friends all know that about me. Um, this is a, a part of it. And I, I'm going to just ask you the question. How'd you get this thing out of your studio and into the environment? Well, it's such a long answer that I'm not going to answer the, the whole thing because that's the technical side and it's really complicated. But the short story is we put a clear adhesive film onto the tile, which is loose. The tile isn't glued to anything in the studio. It's just sitting on the tabletop. We cut it into sections. We number those sections. We make a template, which is an outline of everything. We redraw that template onto the interior wall, put cement on the interior wall, and install the pieces section by section. Each section is about two by three feet, about the amount a person could hold in their hands. But the installation for this was a good, gosh, I think it took us three weeks just to install it and grout it on the wall. It's it's so beautiful that I couldn't stop choosing photos from it. I mean, this is just, I find this to be absolutely breathtaking. Tell me, were there a number of different kinds of tiles involved in this or are they mostly of one nature? So this was kind of interesting and I'd never done one like this in heaven since either. It was all ceramic tile that I made my, myself. I bought four inch square bisque tile that's unfired white tile. And I every night Leanne and I would talk about what colors we needed for the next day of work. Then I would glaze about 50 to, 50 to 80 tiles, put them in the kiln, fire them that night and they'd come out of the kiln in the morning, nice and hot and glazed, glossy and ready to go. Wow, that, so that's like a bake to order kind of thing. Yeah. You are the uh, ultimate baker of and crafter of color. I'm sure that everyone is just looking at this amazed at the beauty. So this is another piece that you need to tell me about because uh, you sent it to me. You told me that that is your son. Tell us about this. Well, the picture on the right shows my son Charles and, and I last summer when we finished our work. I did this collaboratively with two friends, with my friend Yaddy Frankel and David Fichter, but I didn't show their work since this is really my, my night. But um, uh, I wanted to show the studio shot just to show the scale of things and to show how we set a project up. You can see all the tile on the left-hand side. We need hundreds and hundreds of colors for that. So I thought that might be interesting for people. And the other, I mostly wanted to just get my son Charles in, in here since he's, he's been a real active collaborator and, and helper with me for the last 10 years. And it's about the history of Marblehead. This section is, is a, about, this project is for a new school in Marblehead, Massachusetts. And this is a small section of a very, very large mosaic. And is it, it's meant to go on the wall. You, it's on the floor here, right? Right, so it's, that's the floor of, in the studio building here. And it went on the outside of a new school in, in, in the North Shore of Boston. So now we're going to look a little more at a little more Judaica. So tell us what this piece is about. Well, this one is for the only Orthodox uh, synagogue that I've worked with in, in over right over the years, and it's um, I call it a journey mosaic because it moves from left to right along the unfurling of the scroll. The border has handmade clay tiles again that the congregation created. Um, it has some themes that I've explored in some of my other um, Jewish mosaics, but it, the idea is that there are multiple pathways for people to move along as they move through their Jewish journey. I find this interesting. You say it's an Orthodox synagogue that you did this for? That's right. And we had a lot of conversation about what would be appropriate and what would not be appropriate. So in the end, when they asked me to put in the standing man and the young girl, which is a generation's theme, I was really surprised because I know the idea of, of figures in a um, in Jewish art is, is 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 tricky, but the actual ruling on the part of the the rabbi was that so long as the figures were kept flat, meaning uh, in in a silhouette without uh, details and faces and so on, that that would be fine to do. So 
I took my direction from my, my team there. Yeah, I was surprised when I saw this. I thought, hmm, that's unusual because it, I would have thought the depiction of, of human beings in, in artwork was not something that was approved, but obviously it was. And along the bottom here, are we seeing pieces that uh, individuals contributed as well? Yeah, if you go to the next slide, Shelley, I think you'll get a somewhat of a close up on that, a little bit. But yeah, we had, and this one, it was kind of unusual. We had every member of the congregation make a tile. Usually we have lots and lots of people make them and we get a lot of repetition and we only use some of them. So this one was kind of special that way to, to use every one of them. And they go from, from light to dark or water, you know, sunlight to water. That whole shift of color in the border is important. Interestingly, when the people do these, these, their individual tiles, they're not colored at that point. They do them and they're what, what it's clay, right? So right. they're working in clay and then they don't know what color it's going to be, right? No. And I don't know. I had, I had the woman who was, uh, brought me into the temple, um, uh, help me decide where they were going to go. Cause there's actually a narrative in the pieces and how they relate to the, to the, to what's above them in the scene. I'm going to just give Michelle a heads up that I'm going to call on her in a few minutes, but I just want to point out here, here is the piece as it is shown in its installation, in its installed spot. And this here looks like a, a, a transparent uh, mechitza that you might find to divide the men and the women. Is that what this is? Yep. And in this case, it was kind of all the more important because if I understand it right, most of the creation of the new temple had to do with leadership from the patriarchy and the matriarchy also wanted to have a say in things so they were the ones that brought me in so this was um, done under the, the woman the woman's uh, leadership um, very interesting that's on, that's on the woman's side <laughs> oh it's on the woman's side i love the uh, the pomegranates and it's it really works oftentimes i'm sure you find or i'll ask you do you find that sometimes your art stands alone and then you see it installed in a space and you go oh you know why does there have to be a thermostat here do you yeah. ever have those thoughts sure and those those are it's one of my great frustrations as somebody who really cares a lot about how art and architecture fit together you know that's always been my primary interest so it's frustrating to me that i'm often brought in well after everything's been decided and we they feel the need to create something beautiful because they've got a big blank area, but it wasn't part of the original plan. So we have to kind of jerry-rig the whole site. And that is that is frustrating to me. I mean, you make, we make the best of it, but in, in the old days, there were, there were many periods in art history and architectural history when all those things were designed together. And that would be my preference. Yeah, I can't imagine Michelangelo coming in to the Sistine Chapel and there being like a, an air, air return duct in the middle. But I have, <laughs> I can tell you something that would happen today for sure. Because <laughs> the engineers would be there first and then the, the artists would come in and go, what did you give me? But uh, in any event, I'm sure you work it out and work around it. So now I'm gonna show an image of a magazine that, and this is showing the piece that we studied together that we looked at and shows how it goes up the stairs and how people experience the, um, the seasons, the four seasons and, and the nature and a very intense um, sort of detail here. And I'm gonna ask Michelle if she could turn on her camera and pose some questions that might have come up. Well, thank you both so much. And there are quite a lot of questions, so hopefully we'll get through them. Um, Carla, who shared with us at the beginning that she's from Mexico, and I got a little message that she also works in mosaics. And she says, what do you think about the fact that mosaics are not considered art? And why are they not generally exhibited in galleries? I guess that's a question for me, Carla. Um... I mean, it's a tough question for me to answer. Uh, you know, I, I consider mosaics uh, art. I don't consider them anything other than art. Um, but I also don't distinguish between crafts and art in a very general way. It's a conversation I've had with a lot of my friends. Um, I, I know there's a whole controversy in the art world about what makes art different than craft, but I just don't see things that way. So the question for me is, 
is a hard one to answer. Um, and the second part of your question about whether or not um, um, I'm sorry, Josh, you covered your microphone somehow. Oh, there you here, go. Here in Boston, the um, mosaics are often shown in galleries and are treated as a fine art form. So, you know, I don't know exactly what you're dealing with in Mexico, but I can tell you to rest assured that at least here, mosaics have made a strong imprint on the art world and the, the world of fine art. So Ruth Ann asks, when you're working with a community group and everybody is gluing tiles on, how do you ensure the quality of the applications? Um, the only thing that I care about is that they get enough cement on the bottom of the tile. <laughs> Otherwise, things are fine. Every so often, I'll have to take my chisel out later and chisel something out. But I would say it's, it's less than 1% of the tile. You know, People's instincts are good, and I like the, I really love the mixing of the way the whole thing looks. I love what pre people bring to it. Um, and people get some direction too. It's not a free for all. Um, no, but that part goes really well. And I, as I said earlier, that community aspect of it, not only do I love it, but I think it leads to really good um, uh, results uh, artistically. Thank you. And Rebecca wants to know, how many people will it take to, to build and install these mosaics? So the building, if I'm building just in the studio with assistants, usually I'll have a, one or two assistants, and that's enough. Um, when we're working on site, the whole process is designed around the group experience, so we could have 20 or 30 people working at a time. Uh, usually we don't, though. Usually we have about 10 people working at any given time. Um, sometimes we'll have a couple hundred people work on a project in a, a school or a synagogue. And then installation every time is different. Installation has, is a contracting process. It's like being a builder. The work's heavy, it's tricky, and it has to be done in a very particular way. So, and, and actually, almost no two projects of mine are done the same way for installation. I change things all the time. Um, it drives some of my art friends a little crazy because they tend to do things more the same way. But for me, it gives me more freedom of material choices to change materials. But installation, usually it's a team of, again, two or three people working for a few days or a couple weeks, depending on how big the project is. So always being fluid and always responding to the energy. And now Bilham wants to know, when you're entering all these competitions, do they give you some guidelines as what to include in the murals or is it free range? Gosh, that's uh, a good question. Uh, usually there's no guidelines whatsoever. All there is is there's a building or, and walls on the building or pavement. And so you develop your theme based on what you think is a good response to the site. So that's why competitions are so hard. You know, you you come up with your own strong idea but it might not relate in any way to what the, the jury who's selecting the work is interested in. Um, so. And Belinda asks, or she states that she loves the iridescent tiles. She wants to know where are they from and do you use them very often or is it something that you use selectively? Belinda, is that, is that right? Yes, Melinda. Melinda, hi Melinda. Um, uh, the t I buy most of my tiles from two suppliers, and I can give you their names. One's called Marilyn Mosaics, and the other's called Mosaic Art Supply. They have pretty much anything I could ever need, except for the clay stuff that I make myself. And they have a whole, a sample, many sample boards of um, iridescent and metallic tiles to pick from. And, you know, I use a lot of iridescent and metallic uh, and mirror tiles, all those things as accents. But you have to be careful that you don't use too many or too much because then they don't, they're not as effective. Okay. Karn has two questions. So the first, she wonders if you consciously made the decision to become a mural artist or did it happen more organically? And I know I also share this. The second question is, how can we stay at this beautiful chateau? Where is it? <laughs> well, I answer the second question first. It's called Chateau Picontal, P-I-C-O-M-T-A-L. Uh, go online and you'll find it. It's a spectacularly beautiful place, not primarily because of my work. My work is really extra, 
the the site itself is just beautiful it's above a mountain lake it's below the, the alps um, it has a beautiful pond and it has fountains and a, an orangery in the backyard and 50 acres of, of, of orchards behind it. it my friends did a really good job because it was kind of a ruin when they bought it so it's in the French Alps and just look under Chateau Picontal, Picontal and you'll find it and let them know that I, I sent you there. Um, and um, the other question about, um, what was the other question? How did you decide to become oh. an artist? Did it happen organically or? So when I was in college, I was, I was an art major and I was a double major in art and biology. And um, I was asked by my local pizza parlor where we went for our pizza every day if I would paint a mural for them. And I did my first mural in there and I had such a good time, I was 18, that I knew that if I ever got a chance to do another mural, I would do it and it kept going like that. I kept getting more and more opportunities and, and every time it was the most thrilling thing I'd ever done in my life. I mean, it's, I've done a lot of interesting hiking and sailing and all kinds of fun adventures, but doing these murals was, was for me probably the most interesting challenge I ever had. And Michelle, is it, is that, uh, can we wrap that up and we'll come back for questions later? Um, it's up to you if you're watching the time. I do have more questions, but maybe we could hold on to them and wrap up. Yeah, let's and do that. Go back. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. I want to be able to thank Joshua formally. Thank you so much for participating in our project. We're so delighted to have you. You're an amazing artist and you've complimented the artists that we have had. So thank you so much for the time you put into it. Thank you so much for your energy, for listening and working with me. Uh, very grateful to you for that. And, and to the Guild. Well, Shelley, it's been, it's been a fun journey for me. It's the first time anybody's ever asked me to do a retrospective of my work to cover the whole span of the years because this shows 30 years of, of my work and my life and it's been really fun to just get your viewpoint you have a unique way of looking at everything and uh, a very very astute um, and perceptive uh, uh, eye on the work so it's it's and it's been challenging for me because you've asked, you've asked me questions that I haven't been asked before so anyway I just want to thank thank you very much for inviting